This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. My God, Michelle, I should get you to do the introduction whenever I give a paper anywhere. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed that. Um, and if it's on tape, I will take it home and play it over tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, killing, torturing, and letting die. Um, I could give you know, and just offer general reflections about how to teach this or general reflections about my teaching method. Uh, as I was telling Michelle earlier, uh, I'm an old white tenured man and banalities and generalizations just trip flowingly from my lips. Um, I can go on for hours. Um, but I find that's not really what I do particularly well. I can offer some reflection on what I do. Uh, but I thought rather I would demonstrate, and at least for a good part of the hour, I, how I teach this material. Um, and I do it by example. Um, some of the examples may seem gruesome, uh, and they are indeed vivid. Uh, one thing that we might talk about um, is what effect does this have on students hearing them and thinking about them? And one nice thing about it is it encourages them to think. Um, they become very involved in the cases and, and will typically come up and talk to me afterwards for some time, construct cases of their own. Uh, and that, I think, is a, a positive part of it. Um, the basic issue is the old issue of bad means to good ends. I, this is an age-old problem, um, both for philosophers and non-philosophers. Uh, Dostoevsky was obsessed with it, as some of you may know vastly better than I do. Uh, but in the Grand Inquisitor speech from the brothers Karamazov, um, um, Ivan and is talking to Alyosha, um, and he says, tell me frankly I appeal to you, answer me. Imagine that it is you yourself who are erecting the edifice of human destiny and with the aim of making men happy in the end, of giving them peace and contentment at last, but that to do it, it is absolutely necessary and indeed quite inevitable to torture to death only one tiny creature, the little girl who beat her breast with her little fist and to found the edifice on her unavenged tears, would you consent to be the architect on those conditions? Tell me and do not lie. Um, it's also a practical problem. Again, as some of you no doubt know far better than I, uh, there were debates in the US Air Force in World War II about the moral permissibility of area bombing, uh, which they knew was going to kill civilians. I and mean, is this an appropriate uh, bad means to achieve a good end? Um, philosophers. Uh, like to think of what they do I mean, as uh, an activity. Uh, and typically we talk about doing philosophy. It's not a set of doctrines. Um, so what I'd like to do I mean, for the next oh, 20 minutes, half hour, I mean, is actually do some philosophy with you. And this is what I do with the students. Um, I'll offer you some cases and see what you think about the cases. And then we'll see what principles we can derive from the cases and compare our reactions I mean, to the cases I and mean, to the principles. Um, and in particular, we'll see if we can maintain consistency. Um, it is much harder, I think, I mean, to maintain consistency on this topic than you might think. Um, the last point, uh, before actually turning to the more interesting part of what I'm saying, which is the examples, um, is that, of course, in order to decide what to do in any particular situation, and it's not enough to have a general principle, I mean, since if you have no facts about the case, I mean, you can't apply your general principle. Um, but similarly, I mean, it won't help you decide what to do if you have all the relevant facts about a particular case, and, but no idea of what you should do. Um, no, something like a principle or at least considerations that weigh in favor of doing one thing rather than another. Um, none of this, and what today I'm going to be talking about primarily are principles I, uh, that are based on our reaction to um, in some particular cases that I described. Um, from this, nothing follows I, about, nothing immediately follows about what to do in various 
unpleasant circumstances. And nothing follows, nothing immediately follows about and Israeli policies with regard to Palestinian prisoners. Um, nothing follows about uh, U.S. treatment uh, of um, prisoners in the war on terror. Uh, in order to arrive at those judgments, you'd have to combine what principles you arrive at with the facts of a particular case. And I'm not the best person in the world, or best person even at this university, and to ask for particular facts about these sorts of cases. That requires empirical information, and I'm not in possession um, of as much empirical information about any of these questions as many of my colleagues are. Um, so. On to the test cases. And these cases, as you'll notice, are quite artificial. Um, they're not very likely to happen this way in real life. Uh, is that a drawback? I, I don't think so. I, why? I, because, and it's like a problem set in the sciences. And you ask people to solve a problem. And very often, I, they will ignore some variables in doing that. And if they took everything relevant in the real world into account and in trying to determine the answer, the problem would usually become unanswerable. And too many variables just can't solve it. So you've got to ignore some things and to concentrate on the particular principle. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing in these cases. This is why and the cases are so artificial and to allow us to concentrate on certain particular variables. Um, okay. Here's the first case. And this is the, perhaps the easiest case. Here's an island. Um, there's a volcano on the island. It's exploding, lava has flowed down, cutting the island in two. On one side of the island, 10 small children. And on the other end of the island, one small child. All 11 children are alike in all relevant respects. And it's not that you know these 10 are about to die immediately, the one will go on to cure cancer. No, they're alike in all relevant respects. Would that difference make any, I mean, if they were different in that way, would that affect our moral judgment? I neither endorse the claim or deny it. I just want to put that to one side so we can focus on one particular dimension. 10 children here, one child there. You are in a boat off the island. Um, you can go to one end of the island and rescue the one child, and lamentably by the time you do that, the lava will flow down over the 10, killing them. And, or you can go to this end of the island, pick up the 10, save them, by which time flows down over the one, kills that one child. And you can't go to both in the time that you have. Lava has flowed such that you can't get them um, all together, together at one point and get all 11. No, those are your choices. And how many would save the 10? How many would save the one? And actually a famous, uh, there was someone in the Stanford philosophy department. Uh, the philosophy department uh, members just got an email asking, does anyone know where he is now? Uh, he was here in the 70s. His name was John Tork. He became f famous for writing an article, why do, do numbers matter? Um, basically, in which he called into question uh, the preferring 10 to 1 here. Uh, this became an infamous paper in philosophy, but a very famous paper as well. Uh, however, he did get tenure here, and I don't know where he is now. Uh, lost, lost to us. Um, second case, I'm the most vivid and unpleasant case. Uh, however, one noteworthy thing about moral problems is they are often unpleasant. They're often disturbing. So consider this case. I mean, you're the director of counterintelligence in a major American city. And you learn that a terrorist group, in order to attract attention to their cause, is going to attack a school and torture 10 children. Uh, in order to prevent this, I mean, you need to find out what school is going to be attacked and you don't have enough time to send police to all the schools, you don't have the resources to do that, you can't dismiss all the schools. The only way to prevent the attack and is by determining which school is going to be attacked. If not, it will happen. Um, on the bright side, 
and you've managed to take into your custody one of the terrorists of the group. And you politely ask her to tell you which school is going to be attacked. She declines to tell you. Um, you threaten her with the appropriate legal sanctions. And she's still unimpressed. The clock is now ticking. Um, what do you do? And by this, I mean, what do you think it would be right to do? I'm leaving aside what actual legal policies there are. And if you were in the position of responsibility, what would you do? What would you think would be appropriate to do? What would be right to do? Um, how many people are willing to threaten uh, the terrorist with torture in order to extract information? Threaten. OK. Um, sad to say, that doesn't work. Um, how many of you are willing to go on and torture the terrorist? Zero. Um, how, usually I will get, when I do this at Admit Weekend, I will get many, many more uh, willing to go the next step. Um, third step, um, that doesn't work. I, however, when you took her into custody, you also, along with her, was her child of the same age as the children who are in the school who will be tortured. How many of you would be willing to threaten the mother in the presence of the, uh, threaten the child in the presence of the mother to extract the information? Um, how many of you would be willing, actually willing to torture the child to extract the information? And by this time, in a crowd of about two, 300 people, it's down to usually about five at this point. Um, here is the first problem then. Are you being consistent? I, in the first case, and you preferred one bad thing happening, one child dying, to 10 children dying. In the second case, and you're preferring one, it seems you're preferring 10 bad things, 10 children being tortured, to one child being tortured. I, if so, how can that be consistent? Yes. The, the second choice is torture if someone has long term implications for future circumstances. Okay. This one is not. Okay, that's one possibility. Also, in, in this case, whoever dies in your like, commission, or in the other case, like your commission, the director. Okay. Um, I, both are imp important lines of thought in thinking about this issue. Um, Oh, basically, the, there's a distinction between doing something bad and allowing something bad to happen. Um, I, this is an important distinction in law. My wife tells me she's a lawyer. I'm not. Uh, and in most states, and if you say walk by a child that's drowning in a puddle, um, you have no criminal responsibility for doing so unless you stand in some special position of authority or responsibility. You're the child's parent or guardian or police officer or something like that. In most states, and you have no criminal responsibility, uh, my wife told me. Um, so that's the second objection. I mean, the first worry was that I mean, this, uh, the torture case has long-term implications. Um, in particular, it sets a bad precedent. And because if you tell people, look, and in really, really dire circumstances, it would be OK to use bad means. And what happens is and people will then use bad means all the time. Um, and you might think that using, uh, I mean, that it would be OK to kill Werner Heisenberg and if you're about to develop the bomb for the Nazis. And you might think that's a sufficient moral emergency. Uh, but if you tell people that that's OK, and there are going to be a lot of dead people around, and since people lamentably tend to think that whatever problem they have is a genuine moral emergency. Um, now, um, we might then ask, OK, um, suppose we accept that as a good reason. Uh, let me now modify my example slightly. It's a secret. We won't tell anybody. Nobody will ever know. And it will set no precedent effect at all. Uh, would you do it then? I, that's the vivid case instance. And you probably have intuitions on that. Uh, which way you go, though, makes an important difference. 
I mean, there are people who think that all that really matters is the numbers. I'm, but that doesn't immediately lead them to do shocking things. Why? Because they say, take the long-term consequences into account. I and mean, count the numbers not just here and now, count them in the long run. I mean, or count the press, the effect that it will give to other people. Um, count these other non-obvious costs, and you'll see that the numbers go the other way in the end. I and mean, torturing actually would hurt more people, cause more torturing, I and mean, then it would save in this case. Uh, whether that's true or not is, again, an empirical question. Um, but it makes a very important difference which way you go. I and mean, since in one case you're saying, uh, well, if the numbers turned out the right way, then I torture. I, but if the numbers don't turn out the right way, well, then I won't torture. And there's a fundamental difference between saying, and if the numbers work out the right way, and they don't in this case, I, or they don't in other cases we can name, I do it. Uh, but if they did, I would. And the other position is to think that there are just some things so horrible you can't do them. And so this case drives you to go one way or the other. Um, the example that you brought up, or the difference that you brought up, doing and allowing. And it, there is an enormous difference between doing something bad and allowing something bad to happen as a matter of law and as a matter of common morality. Consider this case. You're on a train, going down the track. Train branches off. And you're in the engineer's cabin, cabin with the engineer, talking to her. Suddenly, grasps her chest, dies, heart attack. Bummer. And so she, you try to get help, and you try to get out the door. Door is locked. Doesn't work. Can't open it. Um, what do you see on the track? I mean, as you're going down the track. Sad to say, as you may anticipate by now, 10 small children play. <laughs> the banks are very high. I mean, they can't uh, climb over them. They can't run out. They extend too long. You apply the brakes. Lamentably, the brakes don't work, as you may have guessed. So the train is going this way. If it continues, we'll run over the 10 small children. Um, one student at this point uh, once said, well, that's not a problem. The children shouldn't have been on the track anyway. <laughs> um, on the left-hand track, um, as you may already have guessed, um, as my colleague Mark has probably guessed, keen logician that he is, uh, he's been able to do induction on the previous examples. And what do we see? We see one small child. Again, bank's very steep, can't run, can't get over. Um, but there's a button and on the steering wheel. You press the button, and the train will shift to the left-hand track. And so you won't run over the ten, you'll run over one. And how many would press the button? Ah, yes. I mean, that's the way my intuitions go as well. Without question, my intuitions go that way as well you now have a serious problem. Um, I, since I, I see knowing smiles on many of your faces, and you see what the problem is. I, we, in the island case, I, we said um, one, one bad thing is better than 10 bad things. I, in the torture case, uh, we could either avoid it by appealing to long-run consequences, or we could do it without appeal to long-run consequences by saying there's a big moral difference in between doing something bad and allowing something bad to happen. And it's OK to allow certain bad things to happen. It's not OK to do those same bad things. And so that may have cheered us up. We don't even have to say, if the facts came out correctly, we'd torture in that case. We might not have to say that. However, look at the train case. And it is beyond question. It is obvious. I mean, beyond even objections of most sane philosophers. I mean, that pressing a button is surely a doing. And it's an action that you take. And it might not be messy. And it might not um, require a lot of physical energy. Uh, it might not involve doing lots of things that might make you squeamish. It's just pressing a little button. I and mean, rather like pressing a little button releasing an atomic bomb, or something like that. Um, I, no, you see no uh, 
blood while you do it. But it's surely a doing, it's surely an action. So in this case, what are you doing I'm, if you switch the train? I'm, you're willing to perform the action that results in the death of one person in order not to kill the 10 people. You're actually taking an action to kill the one. How then is this case really different? How then can we, it looks like we've lost the dual out distinction or lost good reason to believe in it, or at least we don't act that way. Or we don't think it's right to act that way in these circumstances. I, what then do we do? I, there are now um, two paths you can go. I, some of you um, I will, I, you didn't, some of you didn't say it at first. I, uh, that's maybe I'd be out of uh, shame I, or um, because you have this conviction. Uh, but some of you may have changed your mind if you think about these examples long enough. Many people do. M many people who are not moral monsters uh, do. Um, a main, one of the main branches of contemporary moral theory and tells us that all that really matters is the numbers. And they can use expedients such as you suggest to show that this is not going to lead to flagrant violations of our ordinary moral intuitions, such as it's not going to torture. But ultimately, it's just the numbers. And someone who held a similar view in the past, John Stuart Mill. Um, and then there are those who insist there's something, yes. Is that the sole purpose of torture is to create and cause suffering, and that to me is a little different. Like it's, it ties in a little bit with the, the argument regarding euthanasia. You know, do you let someone die passively, or do you actively do something, you know, to have them die? And, the, and for me, the deciding factor is the suffering. Mm -hmm. So it's not, in my mind, a complete analogy. Okay, that's a good word. Um, and in doing philosophy, this is what we would do, and if we had more time. Um, because almost any example you give, there's something further to be said about it. Um, let me just sketch very quickly what one might think about in connection with what you're saying. Um, you might have a couple things in mind, all of which are interesting. Um, I, there might be a difference between killing someone painlessly and, and inflicting suffering. I, maybe that's an important distinction that we have to consider at a different example where I, you're actually inflicting pain on the children and on the train track. Maybe the train is moving very slowly. Um, you might instead have a somewhat different idea in mind, I, which is that in order to torture, I, part of what I'm intending to do is inflict pain and suffering. And I can't intend to torture I, without intending I, to inflict pain and suffering. In this case, I'm not really intending to run over the children. I, how can we see this? Um, well, consider. Um, I, if at the last moment uh, the train jumped the tracks before I run, ran over the one child, I, my reaction wouldn't be, damn, I didn't get what I wanted. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't, as a nice person, then jump out and kill the child. I, that would be a bad thing. On the other hand, if I'm intending to torture a prisoner to extract information, and the instrument of torture I, is ineffective, I, what would I, I would just get a new one. And it's part of what I'm intending. Uh, as some of you know, uh, no doubt, I, this is connected I, to the doctrine of double effect. Um, and for instance, endorsed uh, by the Catholic Church uh, to solve certain moral problems. And they think there's a big difference between uh, what you intend and what are foreseen consequences of your act. And that, they think, allows them to solve uh, many of these problems about bad means to good ends. Um, I, certain things are merely foreseen consequences. Um, they're not, in fact, um, things that you intend. Um, so, for, and, and so, for instance, and this accounts for their opinion on um, abortion. Um, they distinguish, for instance, between um, a hysterectomy of pregnant women 
I mean, this may be okay in some circumstances because it's not intended to kill the fetus. And however, for instance, doing an abortion by crushing the skull of the child I mean, is impermissible. I mean, why? And because they invoke this doctrine of double effect. I mean, you may or may not like that application in a particular case, but I mean, that's the doctrine that's used. Uh, similarly, bombing a military base I mean, in a just war, bombing the enemy's military base, even if you know civilians live around it and you're going to kill some, I mean, that can be permissible. Um, however, bombing a football stadium in the enemy's homeland uh, isn't permissible I mean, if you're intending to kill I mean, civilians. And in the first case, you just foresee it's going to happen, but don't intend it. Second case, do. I and mean, whether that works or not um, would be worth further discussion. Uh, and it, the problem is it often becomes very, very difficult like, to draw some acceptable line I mean, between things that you intend and things that you merely foresee. Um, I, for instance, I, um, I, in the, the I, could, it, could I just intend uh, in the abortion case I, to put the child's body in such a shape I, that it's not going to cause the death of the mother? That seems as if it might be permissible. Uh, but still crushing its head I, would not be permissible. Uh, is there really a distinction there between I mean, putting it, intending to put it in its body in such a condition that it won't damage the mother and intending to crush its head? And there are other sorts of examples where it's really very hard to distinguish what I intend and what I merely foresee. Yeah. It seems like the main uh, <clears throat> point that drives this, the situation you put students in, in this kind of a discussion, is a recourse to their moral intuition and a demand on their consistency. Mm -hmm. um, does, I mean, once you get to this point where people find themselves with conflicting intuitions, do you have to, like, defend that, that premise itself, like defend the, the appeal to intuition or to consistency? Um, you could. Um, I, the, the appeal to consistency is the easiest one to appeal, uh, defend, I think, and, and simply because contradictions can't be true. Um, no contradiction can be true. Um, therefore, if you're inconsistent and you believe at least one thing that's false, um, so you shouldn't be contra shouldn't be contradictory. Uh, grand priest to the forget about grand priest. Um, a renegade Australian logician with weird views about this. Um, the other thing to say is, I mean, look at the moral progress and we've made, I and mean, by demanding consistency. I mean, think of I mean, treatment of disadvantaged minorities or treatment of women um, 200 years ago. I mean, don't educate women. Uh, why? I and mean, they're just too flighty and they're dumb. That's why we don't educate them. That's the reason. Here's an instance of a woman, not flighty, smart as any man. Uh, what we don't want the person to say, I and mean, we want the person, to, if they agree with that, then to change their mind about whether we should educate women. And what we don't want them to say is, yeah, I mean, she's not flighty, she's as bright as any man, and all women are flighty and stupid. What's wrong with a little inconsistency? Um, and there is an instance where I mean, moral progress has been made by showing people that I mean, the claims and principles that they enunciate are just false, and that they're counterexamples to them. And when we show people that something's false, and we want them to change their mind. Um, with regard to appeal to intuitions, um, that's an interesting question. I, ultimately, what do we have in deciding what to do? I, one reasonable thing, one plausible thing to think, and one mainstream thing to think, is look, I, in ethics, I, what do we have? And we have our intuitions about particular cases, and we have our views about general principles. And sometimes we find general principles very attractive, I mean, even without thinking about their particular implications. Um, and these are the two things that we have to work on, um, some of our main data in thinking about ethics. So what do we do? And we take our intuitions about particular cases and our general principles and see how they cohere. 
Um, if we find them in conflict, we move back and forth. Um, sometimes we find the general principle so appealing, and we change our judgment about particular cases. And sometimes we find our judgment about particular cases is so firm, we think the general principle just be, must just be mistaken. Um, that's a, a common, common way of doing I mean, ethics and ethical reflection, and not entirely clear what more we can access. Um, this just asks us to think seriously about what we think about particular cases and what, we, and what general principles we endorse and be willing to move back and forth and adjust them both in the light of what we think about the other until we finally get to some place where we hope we're satisfied. Um, that's certainly a possibility and certainly used in many places in the world. Um, and we would then have to think about what form the external authority takes. Um, I mean, is it that I mean, these principles, for instance, are discoverable by unaided human reason uh, if we think hard enough, I mean, but scripture provides us a shortcut to them? human reason could have arrived at them. Uh, scripture just gives you a shortcut. Or you might think it's an epistemically necessary. I mean, if we didn't have the scripture, we just wouldn't get to these principles. And however, once we get the principles, I mean, we can see rationally that they're validated. And if you believe either of those two things, um, and then I mean, the sort of move between principles and cases I mean, has some plausibility. Um, if you think I mean, that certain things are mandated simply because they're willed, what, say what makes them right, I mean, is that they're willed by God. A divine command theory, uh, very important tradition in uh, medieval Christian thought, um, Protestant thought, particularly Luther Calvin, um, important in medieval Islamic thought. Uh, I've not been able to find any clear instances of it in medieval Jewish thought. Um, but if you have that sort of view, I mean, then you should be quite suspicious I mean, of appealing to general principles in conflict with Scripture. Although, again, of course, you still have to interpret Scripture. Um, in particular, if you want to get a general principle, uh, something that's going to guide your action in more than particular cases, I mean, you'd have to see, you have to interpret in some way or another, and what are the canons for interpretation? I mean, Alternatively, you might think that reason's just a bad way of deciding what to do morally. Uh, you'll only get confused if you try to reason about things, uh, and you should go with your immediate emotional reaction. And just go with that. That's another, that, that is another view. Uh, I myself think it has serious drawbacks. Uh, but it's a view that um, I mean, eminent people have advanced, and I'm not saying it's defenseless. And it's just not the project I'm engaged, not the project that I'm engaged in here. Yeah. Isn't there a problem, though? Let's see. If you want to keep rationality in the picture, mm -hmm. doesn't rationality work against empathy because empathy is intuitive and unthought out? So, in order to have rational morality, do you have to, in a sense, dismantle the instinctive or empathic first response? I mean, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it depends on the way you do it. Um, I mean, it depends on exactly how, em how empathy figures into the, the theory. Um, Mill, for instance, I thought I mean, that uh, he was a pleasure-based, pleasure and pain-based utilitarian. Um, and so we just take into account I mean, people's feelings of pleasure and pain, I mean, feelings of uh, empathic pain count just as much as everything else. Uh, we don't try to justify I mean, people's, well, Mill had a somewhat complicated view, but lots of pleasure-based utilitarians think, just count up the pleasures and pains. And we can't distinguish between them by means of reason, except in terms of size, uh, length, and so on. Um, in uh, Bentham's phrase, pushpin is, um, push is as good as poetry. And if it gives you the same amount of pleasure. Um, 
I once received a student essay criticizing this view uh, when I was teaching at Cal, saying it's horrible to push pins into people. Uh, and even if it gives you pleasure, you just shouldn't push pins into people. Uh, push pin was a, a name for bowling. Um, that was common in Bentham's day. Um, so you might think that we just we take as data uh, pleasures, pains, or empathic feelings, and then in thinking about what to do with them and say, do we add them together? I, we appeal to principles of reason. And a somewhat stronger appeal to emotion um, I, would be uh, I'm thinking that what justifies doing one thing rather than another and is the emotion that we feel about it. And the crudest form of the view is, and if you f want to do something, then it's okay to do it. Um, and if it revolts you, then you shouldn't do it. Um, that's the very crudest form of the view and is going to find few takers. And you can have more sophisticated, and many philosophers have developed, uh, more sophisticated ways I mean, of appealing to emotion as central I mean, in morality. Uh, still, even they are going to accept the requirement of consistency. Um, everyone should require, accept the requirement of consistency. Um, anything you want to do, anything you should want to do can be done without being logically inconsistent, I think. But emotions don't have logos, so they're always going to be inconsistent, is my guess. Um, I'm not really tempted to think that we would have to talk more. <laughs> um, two further things. I mean, so, I mean, there are people, I mean, there are the people I mean, who think that um, all that matters is the numbers. I, and so in doing this, I consider those who think that all that matters is the numbers. Um, consider this case, if you think that all that matters is the number and go for the torturing. Mark, my colleague, and has been ill in recent days. He's been coughing. Um, Mark goes to the Aden Health Center. Um, doctor sees him, gives him aspirin, and says, Mark, you're fine. Take two aspirin. You'll be fine in the morning. Lamentably, and as you're about to walk out the door and you hear the screech of ambulance tires, ambulance pulls up. Ten injured people in the ambulance. One needs a heart. One needs a kidney. One needs a liver. You see where this is going. They don't have them there. Can't fly them in. Time is too short. Uh, they'll all die unless they get this. Transplant surgery is perfectly, um, works wonderfully. Again, it's an idealized case. They'll be good as new. Guarantee it. We just need to harvest Mark's organs, um, which he doesn't want us to do. Um, would it be OK to do that? Um, there, even people who think that all that, numbers is the mat all that matters is the numbers will balk at doing that. Although, <laughs> although I did learn from my colleague Deborah Satz, like, who's working on the ethics of kidney transplant, and that in the past two years, a book has been published um, by Cecil Fabre, um, I think a um, political scientist, economist, uh, something like that, and published uh, by him by Oxford University Press uh, advocating uh, compulsory organ donation. Uh, not to the point of death, um, but in compulsory um, organ harvesting. Um, so th this position was once just a logical possibility is now people are moving to advocating something like that. Most will balk at that. Um, if you think, but if you think there are some bad things uh, that you sh just should never do, I mean, like Kant or um, the people on this side of the table, um, there's the problem of numbers. Um, sooner or later, almost everybody cracks under the numbers. Uh, and if 10 to 1 won't work for you, 1,000, million, billion, all life on Earth, and all life in the known universe, almost everybody will eventually crack somewhere under the numbers. And if you crack when it's a million to 1, what's the principal difference between two numbers, I mean, other than that one's bigger than another? Um, so problem, deep problems and worries are there for both sides. Um, let me mention just one last thing. Uh, will any, any discussion about this, on either meta level or discussion about the ethical problem? Yeah. Well, 
the meta level, I'm wondering, like, when, when you get to this point where you've sort of driven everybody into a corner and then painted over mm -hmm. their feet, um, <laughs> do you have, like, does, do you find that that does more to turn the conversation off and cause the students to retreat or more to engage them and get them interested in what you're going to say next? Um, I've actually find it engages them to a, much more than many of the other things I do. Um, and one thing that I stress to the people at the end of the lecture is, look, you're going to Stanford. I, because you're going to Stanford and you're going to grow up and be chiefs of staff, you're going to be government policy makers, and you're going to have an influence on how people live, these, live your lives. And these issues about numbers and are idealized cases. And, but again, as many of you know vastly better than I, what are the main techniques in policy making? cost-benefit analysis. Uh, government agencies uh, might have really good statistics, like for instance, about uh, how many lives you save if you tweak emissions requirements that much, right? or if you build um, fences along roads. Uh, and these are forms of weighing costs and benefits, or weighing, doing a utilitarian calculus. And so you're going to be doing that sort of, you're going to be making these sorts of decisions, many of you, in policy. Um, so if you're in conflict, you may as well, since you're going to affect people's lives and you have some responsibility to do it after thinking about it. Uh, maybe you haven't worked out an answer, uh, but you can't just say, I hadn't thought about it. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's, I, don't, it, I can't think of a situation uh, where I think that's a reasonable way to proceed when you're exercising serious authority over other people's lives. I just feel it's good. Um, if they do it, they should think about it. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not a philosopher or anything, but I've, one objection I've heard to this tip, ticking time bomb scenario mm -hmm. is that it's, it, it's just the point you've been making, that it's extremely unlikely, um, and, and that it's a bad idea to use extreme examples to, to, to make policy on a, in, um, on a more normal basis. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the, the other thing about the example is that it has a connection to contemporary political issues mm -hmm. that the, you know, these more abstract issues mm -hmm. don't, or cases mm -hmm. um, don't. And so I wonder if you have concerns about this exercise leading students to feel like their conclusions have committed them to um, a, you know, political position, mm -hmm. or um, uh, to um, you know certain practical implications, mm -hmm. when in fact this ticking time bomb scenario is extremely unlikely, and it doesn't necessarily follow that mm -hmm. there are any political implications. Mm -hmm. from it. Um, well, certainly one thing that I try to stress and did a bit at the beginning is, um, I mean, for any practical situation. And to make any practical decision, and you need something like a principle, and some, at least some reason for what you're doing, and, and, and some view about the particular facts in the case. Um, and so this is just a discussion of principles to see how they play out. And we need to know a lot more and about the particular circumstances. And so it's important to see and that from these, there is no, there is no direct there's no implication to what to do in particular cases at all. Yeah, and we at least have to add facts. Students are, you know, what really get, what's gripping mm -hmm. about the example is you feel like, yeah, there, there could be a practical implication. Oh, there certainly could. I mean, there certainly could. I, and I think there should be. I and mean, it's just that to see what that is, and you need the particular facts as well. Um, what I think about the extreme cases, uh, is it okay to talk about extreme cases? I, there, uh, my view is yes. And the reason I think it's okay to use the extreme cases I, is that I, they bring out I, certain theoretical reflections. Uh, and in policy debates, or just in thinking about these as human beings, um, I, we, can't, we can't rely on hoping um, that uh, people are never asked to think about these things. Um, and when you have a moral discussion, have an ethical discussion, uh, and people raise all sorts of worries, problems, principles. 
Um, and what we want to do is like, have people aware of what the range of options is uh, and reasons for going one way or another. Um, what we don't want to teach them or just have them think is that at least we don't want people who have gone through a place like Stanford um, just to think torture is always bad uh, without thinking about these examples and what they're going to say. I mean, because it's very hard to become, to preserve their innocence. I mean, someone, someday, somewhere, um, and particularly if they're actually making decisions that have an impact, I mean, will present cases like this. And then, what do you do? Um, they should know what the options are um, and know how to defend what option they choose and what are the reasons for it. Um, and if they don't think about examples like this, and in general, if they don't think about what principles they endorse, I mean, the problem with that, I mean, as Socrates saw a long time ago, I mean, is ask them a couple questions, I mean, they fall into contradiction. Um, and this is not a good thing, uh, usually. It tend, first of all, just tends to tick them off needlessly. Um, and secondly, it, it just makes them all too easily skeptics about arriving at any moral principles. Um, they believe in this. I mean, here's a counterexample. They give it up. Um, well, there's just nothing there to be known. Uh, it's all a matter of taste, all a matter of preference. Um, so that's why I think doing this is actually ethically healthy. Um, I admit, however, I don't have good social science evidence I mean, to support <laughs> that idea. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with everything you're saying. I guess it's just the, um, I, I guess I wonder if you wouldn't find it um, he healthy as well mm -hmm. to bring in actual cases mm -hmm. and say, bring in some factual mm -hmm. situations um, where those complexities, um, you know, really, really come into play and, um, you know, maybe complicate it irresolvably. Yeah, and when I have, um, when I team teach, and we sometimes do that, and with someone who knows the policy issues, uh, when I have more than one lecture, I tend to assign uh, material from a wonderful book, um, uh, Just and Unjust Wars by Michael Walzer, uh, where he considers, you know, permissible and questions about what it's permissible to do in warfare um, over the centuries and in various venues. And it's a wonderful book. And Walter uh, is quite sensitive to uh, the particular facts of the case and the details. Mm -hmm. Do you find that your own moral convictions get in the way of uh, leading these discussions or where you're finding yourself in conflict um, because you find yourself wanting to stick to take a side in, in a case and then realize that you can't. And is, is there ever a difficulty with that? Or? Um, what do you do when students demand your own opinion? Um, two things. I mean, first, um, I, I just consider that, I mean, with all due respect to those who feel differently, I, I think it's just a, a matter of professionalization. Um, that I'm here to teach this material, I'm here to expose them to different points of view, reasons one way or the other, and, and if I let my own views get in the way of that, I, that just means I failed. Um, I, I just don't think that's an appropriate thing for me to do. Reasonable people disagree, I, I know they do, because I've lectured with them. Uh, <laughs> and they go into the vast detail about I mean, their particular political prejudices. Um, do I tell students what I think? Um, yeah, and somewhat, I make a somewhat artificial distinction um, by telling them I, I'm not going to advocate a view in lecture. Um, if you want to find out what I think, come talk to me afterwards. Come to my office hours, come talk to me afterwards, and I'll tell you what I really think. Um, but in lecture, I won't. Since you do deal with material that's so emotionally charged, Chris, how do you, or how often does it happen that some of the students in the class get emotional, kind of get off the, um, the dispassionate discussion of it? Does it ever go too far, or are there ways you try to structure it so that it doesn't reach that point? 
Well, in, I, one course I teach uh, in IHAM, Fall IHAM with someone else, is called Visions of Mortality. And it's about issues of death and dying. And this is a... This is difficult material to teach. And when you're teaching it to 200 freshmen, statistics indicate, and it turns out to be the case, um, and people are taking this whose parents have recently died, and who recently lost a friend, and we talk about the permissibility of suicide, and there are people in the course who recently lost a friend through suicide, uh, who, or whose parents are dying during the course. Uh, at one time, we had a student who had a terminal disease taking the course. Um, and thank, we worried for years about doing this because we thought, oh my God, what happens if after the course or during the course one of our students suicides? Uh, and after considering Hume's argument, in favor, after we've done a lecture on Hume's arguments in favor of the possibility of suicide, and what happens if one of the students suicides? Um, I, we try to make sure that I, the TFs and others I, pay attention to their students' emotional state and make sure to re refer them on to and counseling services, make sure that they take advantage of that. Uh, I rarely, I mean, I've certainly not seen someone burst into tears in lecture or something of that sort. I think it's more likely in the smaller groups. Um, and one thing that I do tell them, uh, and one of the few I mean, personal references I do make in the lecture, in my lecturing is, you know, look, I, we know that some of you have gone through these experiences and the material may be painful. Um, I, I myself lost someone in a stunningly horrible way, stunningly painful and horrible way. It was very close to me. Uh, and I believe me, I understand grief. I understand grief that does not go away. Um, talking about the things I'm, is part of what I do professionally, and I hope it helps and doesn't hurt. Um, I'm not a, I'm neither God nor Freud, um, <laughs> nor a, some, nor a, oh, nor an experimental psychologist. So I don't really know. Uh, whether it helps or hurts, I'm hoping that reflection on this is helpful. I'm at least optimistic about reflection. I tend to think rational reflection on most things is a useful thing and tends to make things better. Uh, but maybe it doesn't. Uh, but that's all that, that's the only service I can provide. Um, I can't prescribe, um, don't do therapy. Um, this is what I have to offer. And here's something of a warning beforehand. I, this is what I'm going to be doing. If you don't think it's going to work out for you, please do something else. Yeah. Do you think that the more like ridiculous examples or examples kind of help diffuse the emotion associated with the issues? They certainly do help diffuse the emotion. One might worry if it diffuses it too much, which I think was some of the worry back here. And it makes it uh, and all too easy to endorse a general principle and then not take into account the actual human consequences of doing it. Um, the, the vivid examples and I, the deliberately somewhat shockingly, uh, gruesomely humorous black humor examples, um, I find useful in that it helps, it encourages students to talk about this uh, much more than lots and lots of other material. Uh, when I give a lecture illustrating the difference between Aristotelian logic and Stoic propositional logic, I try to show them, gee, this is a whacking big difference. Um, some nod, um, and a few find it interesting, but I don't find groups of 10 or 20 students clustering after class. Um, exploring the exact difference between syllogistic logic and propositional logic. Um, so it makes them want to talk about it. And I, in general, think that that's a large part of my function. I'm here to get people to talk about things and try to do it in an intelligent way. I, if I can promise anything, I, I, that's what I, I can promise. I can promise to try to get people to discuss and I know enough about what I'm doing that and I can 
help in some ways the discussion be rational and reasonable. Can't guarantee the truth, uh, but that I can do, and I think that's what I'm here to do. Yeah. So I've uh, anecdotally seen student responses to, I guess, the, the black humor and the more ridiculous examples that are introduced when the topic isn't necessarily death and dying, mm -hmm. but it's something more about the will or the intention mm -hmm. or something. And invariably, it's very positive. Students really enjoy it. But I'm wondering, have you ever have you ever encountered any resistance to those examples or uh, from the students? Has that ever happened? Um, the only, <laughs> I, the um, only instance of worry that has ever happened was um, the University of Chicago, where I taught. I mean, has something like, and it, it has a single, it used to at least when I was there. I had a single course that everyone was required to, human, humanities course everyone was required to teach in the humanities of the incoming faculty. Uh, there, and you had to teach Aristotle. Um, and this person was a linguist. Uh, and she was a friend of a friend, a friend of a colleague. And she was here at Stanford. And she said, well, how do I do this? You know, I don't know anything about Aristotle. There's no reason I should. And it was on Aristotle's ethics and issues about responsibility. Um, so like, she came, talked to me. I, I gave her some examples. Um, and I, again, of the striking kind. Uh, and that tend to make you think more I mean, about what you think in a particular case. Um, she then learned that after her lecture, um, the chair of the uh, department uh, had sent her a horrified, horrified email to her advisor saying, look, I, this student, this person fantasizes about torturing students. <laughs> How can we hire? What a moral monster. Um, I put this down to uh, maybe the distinction mores between philosophers and linguists, I mean, or the fact, or perhaps more plausibly, since I taught there for four years, uh, and since I don't have much empirical evidence on the other, uh, for the other, I do have empirical evidence for this claim. No one while at the University of Chicago has any sense of humor or fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, many of you know fine people who came here from the University of Chicago. They're so much funnier, happier, and more cheerful. Ian Morris. <laughs> um, as you know, is a very funny, joyful man uh, here. He is by nature at the University of Chicago. He was a dour person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I was also wondering if you ever used historical examples, kind of clean them up a little bit to present as a case, mm -hmm. and then but then go back to the historical mm -hmm. example to show how it played out. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to do that in particular. I would be hap happier to do that uh, in courses th that are team taught, um, simply because um, it's not something that, despite my amateur's interest um, and the fact that I would you know, happily read uh, some scholarly literature on it, I, I really can't pretend to expertise in the topic. Um, so I will sometimes talk about historical cases, but usually not in an enormous amount of depth. Um, I've read, you know, three books on Truman's decision about dropping the bomb. Um, do I really feel qualified to say why he did it or what the source problems are? Um, uh, that's just not what I can do with authority. We'll have to make this the last question, I'm afraid. And the one who didn't have a turn already. I'm wondering whether you find that students, because of their modes of entertainment, mm -hmm. are somewhat desensitized mm -hmm. to violence mm -hmm. on human and animal bodies. And if so, just giving extreme or gruesome examples um, reinforce that desensitization? Mm -hmm. um, I've certainly worried about that. Um, I don't really have a good answer to that. Um, I, what I, I think that I do have some evidence that the examples provoke further thought and discussion. 
Uh, what I'm guessing is, or what I'm hoping is, I mean that the role that one or two examples in my lecture uh, have, given the amount of other stuff that they're doing to desensitize them to violence, I mean, the marginal impact is going to be relatively small. Um, if I can get them to reflect on what they're thinking and call into question their beliefs and get into the practice of doing that, um, and I think that's something that happens more rarely in their life. And it's not that they're getting that every day on MTV and or other places. Um, so I'm hoping that the, the benefits outweigh the costs, although I wish I, wish I knew. Um, I do wish I knew. I don't. Well, please join me in thanking Chris for a wonderful discussion. And thank you all for coming. And please notice we have another lecture two weeks from today, same time, same place. I didn't get to. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.